So substance use disorder is a human problem. And it's helpful to sort of frame it in this way. Addiction is a human problem. It's been around since the ancient Greeks, at least been wrestled with since the ancient, ancient Greeks. There's a lot that's been talked about it in terms of ethics, morality, also in terms of behavior, human nature, so on and so forth. Addiction was addressed with the beginning of Islam as well. So it's not a new problem to Islam. Wine was a part of life in pre-Islamic Arabia. There's at least 100 words for alcohol-related beverages. Some scholars say many more. Uh, and it's all over Arabic pre-Islamic poetry. Um, so the, the, the fact is, is it was a really important part of life. And the idea that Islam could interview, intervene on a societal level and change that is significant. So it's a human problem. And the Muslim response in that early community was a very human response. After the first ayah came down in Surah Al-Baqarah about intoxicants, some people stopped, but some people continued. It was an outright ban at that point. The second ayah came down, more people stopped, uh, but not banned. And um, some people continued. The second ayah, people were banned from continuing to pray, to, from coming to prayer while intoxicated. So you almost see this, this um, increase in spirituality and this decrease in substance use and sampling sobriety. So they were banned from coming to prayer intoxicated. What, is it, what did that mean in the early community? That was their sort of core spiritual practice. They would come together as a community. They would have that accountability, structure, support, and then also have the ability to to pray and connect in a very powerful way. Their third ayah came down and it was banned, intoxicants, and there was wide acceptance of it. But still some companions struggled, um, as Dr. Hassan mentioned, and this was after the, the, the ban of it. So the point I'm trying to get across is they stopped, but through a gradual process of change and over time in a very human way, um, so it's a human problem. It's a human problem. Muslims were affected back then, and they're affected now. Muslims needed support back then, and they need support now. Like Dr. Hassan mentioned um, about the companion that Qasasam was ke kept a connection with him and um, supported him through that. Um, so you, you can almost look at it like a circle, like I have in the slide. The larger circle is the human circle. It's a human. Within that human, you have risk factors and you have protective factors. Where does Islam come in? Where does spirituality come in? It's a protective factor. So you have a small circle. If it's somebody with an addiction, you're going to have a, a small circle. That's going to be their protective factors. That's going to be overwhelmed by the risk factors, which is the bigger circle. So, you know, we're not going to go into risk factors. That's just out of the scope of this presentation. But the risk factors for substance use disorder are essentially the same for Muslims and for people who are not Muslims. Risk factors are essentially access to substances. If you're in an area with increased access, if substance use is more normalized in your community, in your family, amongst your role models, then that's a risk factor for developing a substance use problem. Also stress. So different types of stress, trauma, life stress, um, growing up with, uh, with stress in the family, marital discord or parents with marital discord, um, mental health conditions, so on and so forth. So those are risk factors for developing a substance use disorder. Protective factors are sort of the opposite of that. It's a lack of access, um, so on and so forth. But one protective factor that's incredibly important is spirituality. Spirituality, in many studies, as we'll talk about soon, have been shown to be a protective factor against starting substances in the first place or experimenting with them, and also a protective factor from transitioning from substance use to addiction or substance use problems. So. Then we come and we talk about treatment. So what do we mean by treatment? Treatment is essentially strengthening 
one and reducing the other. So reducing your risks and those risks that are in your life now and strengthening your protective factors. So treatment is essentially building up your spirituality, building up all your other recovery capital and and, and going to treatment. So getting mental health condition, treatment for mental health conditions, treatment for your substance use disorder. But the idea is this framework is important. It's not the Muslim is the larger circle and then, you know, all this stuff is happening within them. So you have a human and Islam is a part of that human. And it's a protective factor when it comes to substance use disorder. And it, it, that spirituality is just that. It's going to be dependent on how big that circle is. So if spirituality isn't playing much of a role in their life, it's not going to be as strong of a protective factor. Um, and with that framework, I wanted to talk about spiritual assessment. So this is um, a mnemonic. It's an easy to remember mnemonic. And it's a good introduction to a spiritual assessment uh, in your patients. So, and as it, you, you use it and get more comfortable with having these conversations, you just build off of that and it could be a little bit more unstructured. But HOPE stands for um, H-O-P-E. So let's go through it one by one. By the way, when we think about a spiritual assessment, it's going to be in the broader scheme of our substance use disorder assessment, which is going to assess for psychiatric conditions, um, medical conditions, which are important if people have chronic pain, other issues that's important to keep in mind. Also, their um, social history is important to get. If there's substance use, substance users at home and we create a great treatment plan for them and then send them back to that same home, all of our work is going to be um, significantly less, less effective. And then, of course, the substance use history, so length and frequency of their substance use, when was their last use, their risk for withdrawal. Within that larger framework, we can insert the spiritual assessment because the spiritual assessment is going to tell us about their recovery capital, their spiritual capital to be able to uh, effectively treat their substance use disorder. Okay, so H stands for hope, strength, comfort. Uh, so with, with the H mnemonic, uh, the H mnemon uh, letter stands for hope. So you're not asking about religion here. You're asking about what the patient, where the patient finds these things. So where do they find hope, strength, comfort? For some people, it might be Islam. Others, it might not be. But this is a great way to assess this in an open-ended way without sort of feeding answers or making them feel obligated to say something like, religion's important for me. Again, we want to get to the truth so we can have a realistic uh, a view of how we can intervene on this. Always for organized religion. What's the role of organized religion in this patient's life? What's the ro uh, role of religion? So it's helpful to ask what this means to them. And then as a separate question, what does it mean for their family? So these are two separate data points. What does religion mean to them? What does religion mean to their family members? And understanding both of these can be an important piece in order to piece together the whole overall story, because that can be two separate things, especially if you have a family member that's bringing in their loved one for a substance use assessment. You want to make sure you don't assume that what uh, what religion means to their family is the same thing as what religion means to them. And you want to try to refrain from any implicit assumptions. This is a hard one. It's, it's hard for me. Um, and it's it's natural. Having a, assumptions is expected and natural. You just want to be aware of them uh, so that you can, so they don't operate subconsciously with you through. What aspects of religion are helpful? That's a question you want to ask. Um, and what aspects of religion are not so helpful? This is also important to get their idea of what their definition and conceptualization of religion is. Um, what What is sort of interfering with their life and then also community are they part of a religious community do they pray eid salah juma ramadan like what is their engagement how many times do they go to the masjid in a year those are questions that get an idea of what this means to them and paint a picture for you to intervene on 
The P stands for personal spirituality and practice, practices. Okay, so now outside of religious practices, do you have any spiritual practices that help you personally? Uh, so spirituality, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, might just be an open word, more of an open concept for some people. Um, and they might be able to generate some different answers based on that question. E stands for effects on medical care and end of life decisions. So in this situation, and that, that's what it stands for in the uh, in the mnemonic. But in, the, in this situation, we want to talk about addiction. How has that affected your religious practice or spirituality? So I'm going to talk about some case examples. Let's say these are archetypes of people that we commonly see. Let's say you have a young adult. Let's just call it 18 to 25. That's an adult. His parents are devoutly Muslim. And he doesn't really connect with it uh, at this point in his life. Uh, and he's not really connecting with his parents either. He's in early recovery. He's made some progress in staying sober, abstinent from substances. But he's not close to Islam. And he's also just not thinking too hard about it. He's just taking it one day, one week at a time. So what are the questions we can ask this person? What are their sources of hope? So in this person's situation, um, he says friends are supportive. Making music is supportive. Music is a, is, is a supportive way and a release for him in general. Um, but what's interesting in, here is these are not religious sources of hope, uh, but they are supportive for this individual, and it's important to keep that in mind. What's the O question? What does or how does organized religion have a role in your life? Now, in this person's situation, no religious engagement currently, which is not too much, um, is not too um, uh, aberrant. It's, it's not too too much of a shocker. So, what is the role of organized religion? Maybe nothing currently, but it's still a good question to gently and non-judgmentally pry about. So, for example, in this person's situation, they talk about their childhood, going to Sunday school, fasting in the month of Ramadan regularly, praying daily in the past, maybe not every prayer, but daily, uh, and then parents are devoutly religious. Those are all important pieces of information. And then asking, what are your personal practices of spirituality? And the patient still has, a, uh, the patient says, nature is something that they're interested in reconnecting with but then also going to ramadan they might have some good memories around ramadan or other things um connected to the deen um or maybe just spiritual talks or there's somebody that they listen to on youtube or somebody that they listen to in their community that just gets to them or gets at them um resonates with them in a, a special way so what's interesting here is this person still has a connection with spirituality that can be nurtured. Um, and then E, how does addiction affect religion, religion and spirituality? Um, and what's interesting is, um, in this patient's situ uh, answer, he says he feels bad about it because it's dissipating, disappointing his parents. So what's interesting here is the religion is somewhat connected with the parents. It's not affecting his spirituality. It's affecting his relationship with parents. Um, just something to notice and something to be curious about and interested in, uh, interested in. All right. So now take another example of an assessment. Again, a archetype of something we see mm, uh, often. So hope. H stands for, what are your sources of hope? So this is a person, uh, Islam was a positive spiritual experience in their life. To help them in their sobriety. They've obtained years of sobriety. They had to move back to an old neighborhood recently, and they're struggling because substances are around, are around that neighborhood or people that they knew who used in the past, who they used in the past with, are in that neighborhood. Um, now they're at a point where they're increasing their engagement in re recovery work, and so they show up to your support group or show up to your treatment setting. You ask them, what are your sources of hope? Now, this person, he's uh, spirituality is an important part in their life. They're saying prayer in congregation. They're going to weekly dars uh, on on spirituality or deen. They're going to their Friday prayer. They're reading Quran. Um, 
And then also doing some other recovery work, counseling, anger management classes, so on and so forth. What's interesting here is unlike our previous example, the sources of hope revolve around spirituality and therapy. Uh, and then the second question, organized religion, plays a large role in this person's life. The, the third question, their uh, personal practices of spirituality. What's interesting here is everything they say is synonymous with H. So spirituality in this person's life is a source of hope. Um, uh, and that, that's essentially what we, that's the ideal relationship in terms of having it be useful for addiction treatment and recovery. And then how does addiction affect their religion and spirituality? Addiction affects it significantly. It's a, it's a tool for change. Um, and it's a large part of maintaining abstinence. And I, I'm going to, I'm going to keep the same example, but let's just say this person relapses. All the answers are the same. Um, and um, all of their assessment points are are similar. Except now they might have a hard time re reconnecting with spirituality. Maybe it, they've been on a relapse for weeks, maybe months. Now they're having a harder time reconnecting with spirituality. But it's in, really important to recognize that spirituality is an effective tool that they have. And they might just have a little bit of a harder time yielding it. Uh, because of shame and stigma of the relapse and reintegrating into their old community. But there's two main points I want to make here. Number one is we, we really want to have a, a, a good spiritual assessment. Because if we, if we shy away from that or have some reservations about having this conversation, we may miss that really impor uh, important tool that they have. And... Um, recovery tool that they have and then number two we want to play a role in helping re-engage them with this tool of spirituality that they have for their recovery and their treatment um okay i'm going to talk a little bit about treatment now uh now that we sort of concluded assessment and talk a little bit about, about treatment and how spirituality situates its, itself in treatment so first i want to make that claim that Spirituality is treatment. So there's a really great study, references at the bottom. 73% um, of addiction treatment programs in the U.S. include a spiritually based element as embodied in the 12-step programs. Um, and the vast majority, of course, of the 12-step programs emphasize reliance on God or a higher power to stay sober. The study also commented or showed more than 84% of scientific studies show that faith is a positive factor in addiction prevention or recovery. Um, and there's many studies like this. And the, the, the point I want to make is that spirituality is not a detour from treatment. It's not something we're forcing into treatment. It's an essential component of treatment. Um, and that's something that we should um, keep in mind. Um, so when we think about treatment, here's some things that we tend to think about. We tend to divide treatment into these three dimensions based on the literature out there uh, and recognize guidelines, support groups, professional treatment like therapy, counseling, and uh, addiction treatment programs, residential programs, outpatient programs, and then medications for cravings, and then also medications for withdrawal or both. Now, spirituality is something that can be integrated in all of these, and sometimes don't need to be integrated. They're already a essential component of, of some of them, like let's say 12, the 12-step 12 programs. Uh, but for example, with support groups, um, spirituality can be integrated in support groups. You can create support groups that are spirituality or spiritually based. Um, and, um, or you can integrate spirituality into your group therapy, uh, depending on what your audience is or who your group members are. We'll go at the, uh, we'll go into the end of some of these, um, interventions that are available or that have been done so that people can get an idea of how they can recreate that in their own communities, um, or get ideas of, of how to uh, recreate that in their own communities. 
Uh, and then professional treatments. So spirituality should absolutely be a conversation, therapy and counseling, um, and, and can be integrated in these areas as well. And then also medication management visits for, for um, buprenorphine, methadone, um, and other medication uh, for substance use disorder. We have a lot of time in these medical visits in order to have conversations and integrate counseling and um, spirituality assessments, and then also um, spirituality. Um, all right. So how do we have these conversations? Once we assess, how do we intervene? I think it's important to um, look at the stages of change model and, and remember that the stages of change are not just for substance use disorder. Uh, it's for any goal. So like we discussed the treatment dimensions before, the stages of change are really applied to that treatment. So for example, if somebody needs a residential program, let's say they're homeless and this is clearly the choice that they need in order to gain any traction in their substance use problem, let's say they're super motivated to stop using substances, but you as the professional say, no, you need a residential program. You're just not going to be able to do it on your own or you need some treatment. That patient can say, I'm in the action phase for stages of, uh, in the stages of change, but really not in the action phase for any realistic plan for treatment. That patient's not in the action stage. We would consider them pre-contemplative or contemplative in terms of their um, stage of change for uh, their stage for change, for any realistic change. So the point I want to get across here is that the stages of change model is not for I want to stop using substances or not. It's for what treatment are you ready to commit to or take action on? So what is the patient's stage of change for a treatment program? What is the patient's stage of change for meetings? What is the patient's stage of change for spiritual intervention for spiritual interventions? So, so you, you, you can use the stages of change model, and it's a good model to use also in trying to get an idea of where they're at in terms of their spirituality. So, for example, when you have your patient who, in our first example, born into a Muslim family, still Muslim, but just not in a place where they're thinking too hard about them, to, about spirituality, you can put them in one of these stages of change. Uh, because again, spirituality is treatment. And again, stages of change are sort of the industry standard of how we counsel and motivate people uh, to enhance their motivation towards treatment. Um, and so you can put your patients in terms of their um, engagement in spirituality in one of these stages as well. So let's go through each stage one by one, and then we can sort of apply it in terms of um, how that makes sense for treatment as well. So in the pre-contemplation stage, the patient does not recognize they have a problem with substances and are not ready for treatment or changing their behavior. In the same way you can, for Muslims, they might not want to talk about Islam. So they might be pre-contemplative for any treatment, in in including spiritual interventions or spiritual integrating spirituality in their life. So just like they're pre-contemplative about their treatment program, they can be pre-contemplative about their um, wanting to integrate spirituality and Islam in their life. So that what's important here is that your goal here isn't to get them, um, uh, you know, into a treatment program. Your goal is to get them into the next stage of change. So contemplation. So, um, so first we want to understand where they're at in their stage of change, and then we want to employ a well thought out intervention to get them to the next stage of change. At the bottom, there's a reference for a motivational interviewing handbook. Um, there's many handbooks out there. This handbook I like because simply because it, it's developed based on the stages of change. So you can quickly look, is my patient in pre-contemplative or contemplative or preparation stage? And how do I get them to the next stage and just employ two or three interventions and that visit you have with them in, in the group therapy or that visit you have with them in the medication management visit, so on and so forth. So it's a practical way of, of using this. 
All right, so that's the pre-contemplation stage. So the contemplation stage, this is a patient that wants to change. They're starting to acknowledge that their substance use has consequences. But in this stage, they'll still be ambivalent about change and how to take steps towards that change. Maybe they just lack confidence in their ability to change. Uh, For Muslims thinking about spirituality, they may be concerned about their lack of engagement in religion. It sort of got away from them. How do they get to this point? That might be the thoughts that are going in, into their mind. So just like you can work on moving to the next stage of change in terms of getting into a treatment program, you can employ those same interventions. They're flexible uh, to spirituality or any treatment intervention. Okay. So then there's a preparation stage where patients have been learning about treatment options, but not yet started to implement their plan. They're still ambivalent, and they're waiting for an opportunity to nudge them in that direction. You can apply that for their engagement in spirituality and Islam as well. Next stage is action. They're actively changing their behavior, um, but they're not yet settled into that behavior. Once they've been doing it for months, then we consider them in the maintenance phase. And all these stages of change, uh, I'm not going to go over them, but all these stages of change also have interventions associated with them. You can look at the reference at the bottom to see what those interventions are. But you want to create a effective, realistic model of how to integrate spirituality, whether it be in the clinic setting, group therapy setting. And this is a way to do that. Number one, by not conceptualizing spirituality as this other thing from treatment. It is treatment. Number two, then seeing what stage of change your patient is for treatment, whether that be a treatment program, whether it be 12-step meetings or other support group meetings, whether that be spirituality. And with each of those interventions, you assign a stage of change for that. And you treat it accordingly. And if they're contemplating spirituality, then you employ a motivational interviewing intervention to get them to the preparation stage. You get them from the preparation stage. You impl- if they're in the preparation stage, you do likewise to get them to the action stage. And each of these have um, an intervention. So uh, I am going to look at a couple of these. So pre- pr- uh, preparation stage, um, you want to focus on maintaining a connection and an alliance with the patient. You're not going to make headway into um, getting them to change overnight. And you're going to be um, very frustrated if, that, if those are your goals. You want to make smart, attainable goals. Contemplation stage, you want to focus on normalizing the fact that they kind of might want to be going and engaging in some Islamic things, but then kind of not wanting to, and then helping them normalize their ambivalence in that way, um, and and so on and so forth. Um, Spirituality and religion, these are words that are used as two separate words in the recovery rooms and just in the treatment culture. Um, and they're basically the same thing, but they're different dimensions of the same thing. Uh, the meanings to the patient are more important than any words. So you just want to use what words your patients are more open with. Um, and then, uh, finally, um, Islamic spirituality is what is Islamic spirituality? Islamic spirituality is something that's learned through groups, classes, dhikr gatherings, um, through um, education, um, and so on and so forth. And then it encompasses the body, mind, soul. There's a sunnah of eating. There's a sunnah of sleeping, how to take care of yourself. Uh, there's a sunnah of how to reframe your mind in a meaningful way, how to find meaning in suffering, how to cultivate gratitude. And then there's obviously a spirituality of how to feed your soul. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to end with this. These are a lot of really amazing initiatives that are happening in our community. Overcoming Addiction um, is a book uh, by the Thayba Foundation, which talks about how to uh, um, integrate the 12 spirituality into the 12 steps. Um, and it's um, it's really, um, really wisely just done. And it really tracks on the recovery journey that people have. There's another book, Loving the Present, by a Muslim sister who talks about her experience in recovery. Um, there's some rehabs out there that are Muslim-led or integrate Islam um, into their treatment. Tranquility Rehab, Salam Recovery. There's a sober living home through Hype Athletics, which is a nonprofit organization. 
MCC East Bay, there's this is a masjid that is uh, hosts twelve step meetings and has a lot of um, social media content on recovery and addiction uh, for many different people on their YouTube channel. Stanford uh, Islamic Psychology Lab and uh, the Institute of for Social Policy and Change um, uh, are doing a lot of great research in this area. And then a big call out for the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. Their website is at the bottom. Um, uh, this is a Canadian organization, and and uh, Dr. Hassan mentioned it. I'm going to mention it again. It has a lot of really great, um, um, a lot of really great stuff there. So check out that website. And then Militia Islam is something that has been around for a long time, which incorporates spirituality to the twelve steps.